So without further ado, Peter Bogosian and Richard Dawkins. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight, and a special thank you and a very, very warm welcome to Professor Dawkins, who's here to speak with us. I, I had a, a list of questions, but I found myself uh, welled up, incredibly tearful, when I s sat and listened to people. They would come up and they would say things to him about how he's changed their life, person after person. And so I I'm going to read some of the things that people said to him. I'll try not to get too teary for this. Uh, thank you for getting me out of Mormonism. <laughs> the selfish gene inspired me to go into biology. Your work changed my life. Thank you so, so much. Think about that. Your work changed my life. I appreciate your existence. <laughs> The God delusion was the reason I left Mormonism. I can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Dawkins. You saved my life. Thank you for snapping me out of my wishy-washy agnosticism. <laughs> I'm the first member in my family in five generations to leave the Mormon church. Thank you for everything. We had a lot of Mormons tonight. <laughs> Absolutely inspirational sitting here. Oh, that was me. Absolutely inspirational <laughs> sitting here with Richard Dawkins, person after person telling him he changed their life. Um, I've, I came all the way from Canada to see you. Thank you for reasoning myself. Thank you for reasoning me out of something I didn't reason myself into. I love that That's one. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I am unbelievably grateful for all you've done for me. You helped me out of delusion. I drove from Canada to see you. Thank you so much. You've changed my world. Thank you so much. This book has changed my life, the God delusion. Thank you. I owe you life. I, I am so grateful. Your books have helped. Yeah, people suffering from very serious faith-based delusions. Uh, then someone wanted him to sign the Book of Mormon, which he did not. <laughs> Anyway, they, they, they go on and they go on and they go on, and I just, I just wanted to ask you, what, what is that like? It's very moving. I mean, can, can you hear me? Is, is, is my mic on? Yeah. No, it, it is extremely moving, and it's particularly cheerful to me because very many times people say to me, of course, all you do is preach to the choir. And usually I say, well, it's not a bad thing to preach to the choir, actually, because the choir needs, you know, morale boosting. But, um, but it's not true that I only preach to the choir. I mean, we actually do change people's minds. Uh, and I think that needs to be said, because we're so often accused of only preaching to the, to the choir. And we're so often accused of um, alienating people by being too um, in your face. And so often told, the only way to convert people is to be seductive. Yeah. And and to sort of encourage people in, welcome them in and say, it's okay, it's okay. Right. You don't have to give up your, your faith uh, um, you, suddenly. You know, do it gradually and, 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 and you don't have to give this and give that and so on. Um, so I think that the very encouraging remarks that you've read out, which actually I hear everywhere across the United States, especially in the Bible Belt, by the way, mm -hmm. interestingly, um, I think they, they do indicate that, that there is something to be said for just speaking bluntly right. and, and not um, necessarily always going for the accommodationist, uh, sed seductive right. approach. And for all those people who say that you can't reason people out of their faith or it's hopeless, that... We know that's yeah. not true. I mean, look, true. look around. Yeah. Yeah. So we packed a 700... It's a rather, rather patronizing thing to say, yeah. actually, isn't it? That you, you can't reason people out of their faith. Right. And it's looking down on people to right. say that. And reason is hope. Yeah. That's the hope they have. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask some questions, and we um, have the memoir that was on sale. 
Why, why did you write a memoir? Publishers asked me to. <laughs> um, uh, I'm getting on a bit, and um, it's the kind of thing people do when they're getting on a bit. Uh, I, I wanted to... Um, I mean, my, my mother has a very good memory for, uh, for long ago, and she's... Um, uh, I was able to interview her, talk to her. She's 96, and I learned a lot from her and from her diaries. I just missed my father, who died a year before I started it. Um, and as my wife pointed out, if I was going to do it at all, it's just as well to do it while I'm still around myself. Yeah. Was, it, was it different? You've written so many other books. Was it different from your other books? To write a memoir? Yes, uh, it's, it is a bit different. Um, it's, it's a slightly embarrassing thing, in a way, writing your autobiography. You sort of feel, well, who the hell wants to know about me? You know, and, and actually, some of the... Um, uh, there, there, there have been some extremely nice reviews, but also one or two extremely unpleasant reviews. And the worst thing anybody seems to be able to find to say about this autobiography is that it's about the author. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So as I said, not a lot I could do about that, really. <laughs> Uh, you came to reject the belief in God at a comparatively early age. Did your parents come to share your views? I think they always did. Uh, I don't think, I mean, they didn't talk about it very much. I was never really indoctrinated in religion by my parents. Uh, I went to Anglican schools. In England, in my time, it was pretty difficult not to go to Anglican schools. They pretty much all were Anglican schools. Um, and so I was fed the sort of fairly weak and um, not, not too serious version of Christianity, which is Anglicanism. I, I sort of feel somehow if, if you wanted to inoculate a child against a really virulent strain like Roman Catholicism, <laughs> um, the best thing to do would be to vaccinate with a, a, with a weakened strain of the virus. And, and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anglicanism does that pretty well. Uh, so I'm curious about a few things. One thing I'm curious about is what's, what's the best argument you've heard for the existence of God? What's the best one? I don't think there are any good ones, but um, the nearest approach to a good one, I think, is the argument of the physicists when they say uh, the universe is fine-tuned uh, and the, the fundamental constants of physics is sort of half a dozen or so um, numbers which physicists just give us. These, these are constants, and physicists don't know why they have the values that they do. But physicists have calculated, some, not all, have calculated that if any of these fundamental constants were changed ever so slightly, that would immediately wipe out the universe. You couldn't have... I mean, if you change the gravitational constant slightly, um, matter would not have formed itself into stars, and therefore you wouldn't have got chemistry forming in the interior of stars. You wouldn't have got the elements, and therefore chemistry, therefore you wouldn't have got life. So you have this sort of image of half a dozen knobs that you twiddle um, to raise or lower the gain on a particular fundamental constants. And the, there is a, a theistic argument that says um, because these knobs have all been pre are all precisely where they have to be in order to give the kind of universe that would give rise to us, there must have been a divine knob twiddler <laughs> who, who set these constants to exactly the right, tuned them, fine-tuned them to exactly the right value. It's, it's probably the best argument I know. It's still a lousy argument <laughs> because, of course, it leaves completely uh, unexplained where the divine knob twiddler himself came from. I mean, you have to have a supernatural, superhuman intelligence to know exactly what values to twiddle the knobs to. And if you're going to be allowed to postulate an intelligence right from the start of the universe, then you might as well just postulate the, the um, fundamental constants themselves. Right. Um, there are other explanations for the fine-tuning of the universe, and the best one is probably favored by most physicists is the, the multiverse theory, whereby um, the universe that we know, that can, the universe that we can see with our instruments, uh, 
is only one of a very, very large number of universes. Some physicists speak of a bubbling foam of universes. And we're just in one bubble. And each bubble has different values of the fundamental constants. And with hindsight, we, of course, have to be in one of the minority of bubbles that has the fundamental constant set to the right value to give rise to us, because we're here. Right. So it, that, it's, it's the anthropic principle. That, that, that assumes that, and Victor Stenger wrote a, a book about this in The Fallacy of Fine Tuning. Yeah, that, he, he doesn't accept the... the yeah, the, that's that, right. That, yes, yeah. yes. So that, that the universe is fine-tuned for us rather than us being fine-tuned to the universe. Yes. Um, I think in any case, it, it's, it's one thing to say um, that if any one of those knobs was, was changed, the whole universe would fall apart. But that doesn't preclude, I suspect, changing more than one. Right. If you change several at once, then you could probably make a very large number of universes. Um, e even the possibility of a multiverse, though, would seem to me to undermine any sort of faith-based notion. I mean, if... if I'll tell you the best argument that, I, that I've heard. The best argument that I've heard is why is there something rather than nothing? And unfortunately, it's also a very poor argument uh, because e either there was something... It's, it's the multiverse theory for one, and, and if there is a multiverse, then that must, by definition, undermine one's confidence that the universe had a beginning and that beginning was God. Well, even if you have a problem deciding how things began, why there's something rather than nothing, how on earth does it help? to postulate an intelligence doing it. I mean, you've, right. it's, it, it's a mystery how things, maybe it is a mystery how anything started, but it's a hell of a lot easier to understand how something simple started than something as complicated as a divine intelligence. Right. Which, which actually, after my Freedom From Religion talk, we spoke about what it would take us to believe in God, and my claim to you was that it, 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 it just cannot be an internal state. It cannot be a feeling that one has. And it can't be, for example, the testimony of the human, uh, of, of the Holy Spirit. And one reason for that is because people have different testimonials to different things and they're contradictory. And the other one is it, co it could be a delusion. Uh, and how would, you, how would you know if that were a delusion? So, so given that the, this is a big question, but given that the host of arguments don't work, what, what would it take for you to believe in God? Well, I used to say uh, it would be very simple. It would be, uh, you know, the second coming of Jesus or, or a great big, deep, booming bass Paul Robeson voice um, uh, saying, I am God and, and, and I created. But I was persuaded mostly by actually uh, Steve Zara, who's a, who's a regular contributor to my website, richarddawkins.net. Um, he, he more or less persuaded me that if you, even if there was this, this booming voice and the second coming in clouds of glory, the more probable explanation is that it's a hallucination or right. a right. conjuring trick by David Copperfield or right. something. Um, uh, I mean, he, he, he made the point that a supernatural explanation for anything is incoherent, right. that, that it d just doesn't sort of... It, it, it doesn't add up to an explanation for, for anything. Um, a non-supernatural second coming could be aliens from outer space. I mean, a, 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 a superhuman, but not supernatural See, in, in, civilization. In, we, we would have to... So, so if, you, you know, if you walked out and there were these globes that were spinning around that said, you know, I am God, believe in me, or the famous Krauss thing, you walk out into the sky and... It spells out in the stars in different languages, I am God, believe in me. Well, again, the problem is it could be a delusion, but the other problem is you'd have to rule out alternative explanations, like the aliens. I mean, you'd have to... How could you rule out... Well, I mean, there could be an alien trickster culture or something. Huh? We're going to get those little humans. But you'd have to rule out alternative explanations. That's why I'm not persuaded by either an internal state, certainly not a feeling state. So Clark's third law, um, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, magic being super, supernatural. Um, if, you were to, if you were to fly a Boeing 747 back to the Middle Ages, um, you would be greeted as God. I mean, that would be... Um, and, and similarly, an, an alien visitation, any, any aliens who could actually visit us would have to be so far beyond us in their 
technology that they probably could manipulate the stars to, to um, spell out words or geometric forms or something of that so, sort. So that couldn't be enough. So, it, so what, would, what would persuade you? Well, I'm starting to think nothing would, uh, which, which, is, which in, in a way goes against the grain because I've always paid lip service to the view that a scientist should change his mind when evidence is forthcoming. The trouble is I can't think what that evidence would look like. Well, you said something to me after that Freedom From Religion talk that I had thought about for a long time. You said, well, what if it were some, something were contained within the numbers of pi? If, oh, pi. That, that's Carl Sagan. Yeah, yes. we talked about context. Yes. So, but, but, that, but to me, that would seem like that's the way to conceptualize the problem. Like, the way to think through the problem is that something would have to be derivable by the principles of reason. Well, perhaps we should explain what, what Carl Sagan suggested. I mean, in, in the novel Contact, which I think is Carl Sagan's only work of fiction, the heroine, um, I've forgotten what she's called, but, but um, she um, calculates the constant, the mathematical constant pi, out to the umpteenth uh, decimal place, expresses it in binary, and then at some point, way, way out in the, in the billion, billion, billion decimal place, um, she starts putting the ones and zeros into a square matrix. And the, and the zeros, most of the square matrix is filled with zeros. But, there's, but the ones fill a, make, a, make a perfect circle and a perfect diameter of the circle. And the heroine of the, of the novel concludes that this is the signature of God. And it's not, it, and his signature is not in nature, it's not in a, in a beetle's wings or anything like that. It's actually in mathematics, which is the deep, deep, deep structure of, of, of everything. Um, and I presume Carl Sagan was talking about this in order to demonstrate that actually there's nothing that could demonstrate it, right. God, because you, you know perfectly well that you can't mess around with mathematics like that. I mean, the, the values of the, the decimal places, um, numbers in, in pi, they're not the kind of thing a God could mess around with. I mean, it, you know, pi is a, is a mathematical constant which is itself, and, and it, can't be, it, it, it can't be doctored. So there's that idea gone. Um, yeah, I had thought about that for a long time, and I think that way to think about the problem as a principle that that it it should be able to be derived by reason. And I don't I don't know. I think I think you're right. I mean, to, something that stood in isomorphic relationship with the very structural reality that was in a numerical code like pi, and then somehow. Somehow, one, I mean, infinity is a tricky thing, so if there's an infinitely long sequence of numbers, that that would have to reemerge at happen, some point. You think you're saying? Yeah, so I, I don't think it could be that. And you're right, a, a god couldn't, I mean, it couldn't be something that, so yeah, I, I don't really know what it would take. I mean, it's a an infinite number of random numbers that would have to happen. Well, that Which, any sequence with an inf in, in, would be would be repeated an infinite number of times in an uh, infinitely long number. So it it couldn't be that God put his signature in pi. No. Yeah. <laughs> I. You could you could write your signature in DNA. Um, Craig Vent has done it. Right. <laughs> so, um, if at some future date, um, somebody uh, thousands of years hence finds a particular bacterium, it might not be a bacterium, it might be some other creature by then, and they would find written into the DNA, this was made by C. Venter. Um, yeah. Remarkable. Yeah, that would it's be remarkable, remarkable, but it's not supernatural. It's, 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 Right, very natural. Um, so that's a segue into, on, on page one, 182 you wrote, I was delighted to be proved wrong. Think about that. I was delighted to be proved wrong. So much of my work is focused on helping people to develop that attitudinal disposition. 
Um, what do you think we can do to nudge people or groups of people to value being proved wrong? It's one of the great virtues of science that um, we are looking to be proved wrong. One of the great virtues of science that we, that we, we don't know the answers and we like it not to know the answers because there's, that means there's plenty of work to do. Um, I, it's, it's not, I mean, one is a little bit hypocritical to say I was delighted to be proved wrong because um, scientists are human and so they do fall in love with their pet theories. And uh, so um, they have to take great scrupulous care not to let that bias them, which is why uh, so much of modern research uses, and especially med medical research, uses um, double-blind tri trials where, where the, the, the nature of the experiment is that you cannot bias the results of the experiment because you don't know, in the case of a medical trial, you don't know which bottle contains the, the experimental dose and which bottle contains the placebo control. You don't know, the doctor who administers the thing doesn't know, the nurse doesn't know, the patient doesn't know, nobody knows. So it's not possible to be, to be biased either in favor of your pet theory or against it. And I think that's a very valuable, I think to teach people about double-blind control trials is a very good thing. There's a lovely story about a homeopath, this I think is a true story, who was reluctantly persuaded to undergo a double-blind control trial of his homeopathic remedies and so the, the trial was done and needless to say um, the, the result was, was negative um, whereupon he said you see that's why we don't do double blind control trials they don't work <laughs> so he obviously didn't have the uh, attitudinal disposition to, to value I think I think that's part of it. That idea of belief revision and how we how we encourage belief revision. It it may be that just teaching people the methods of science and the tools of science are one way to enable them to to. But you know I, I don't know. Maybe not because maybe it has to be something else. It, it's not just the methods of science, but to actually make it a virtue to nudge people towards valuing belief revision. Yes. I don't know how to do that. I mean, I have some ideas about how to do that, but it's a, it's a very complicated problem. I mean, there are evolutionary pressures, ego pressures, social pressures, familial pressures to be right. Yes, I think you have to um, persuade people that what they believe is, is all very nice, but it's, it's not important. I mean, what, what matters is what the evidence shows. Right. Um, and... Conrad Lawrence used to say that he used to reject six hypotheses every morning before breakfast. That was a lie. Um, but it gives you the idea of, what, of, of the ideal. Right. I don't think he ever rejected a hypothesis in his life, actually. <laughs> and that's unfair. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a curveball. I'm going to switch the this, this subject a little bit. This is uh, particularly appropriate for colleges and, and universities. Censorship, speech restrictions, and what's termed political correctness are advocated by many contemporary leftists. Can you talk about the role of the left in suppressing criticism of religion and faith, particularly in regard to Islam? And I was wondering if you could also draw in the book, you talked about your experiences in Berkeley and then at Oxford, if you could draw upon those experiences. And even more specifically, I'm thinking about the uh, LSE, the London School of Economics, and there were students from the atheist and humanist group who wore these very innocuous t-shirts of Jesus and Mo with a picture of Jesus and they're, you know, they're, they're, to me, to my mind, to any per reasonable person, they're just saying things like, hi there. And they were asked to remove it uh, and they were t told that they're not allowed to come back because this is uh, offensive and insulting to people. And I, I wonder if you could comment on on what's happening in college campuses today and what the role of the left is, particularly with regard to Islam. There's a, there's a, a lot of stories like this and it's a, they're, I think they're really rather sinister. Um, London School of Economics, LSE, is, a, is a, 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 a university with a long and honorable history of radicalism. And it's the last place you would expect this kind of thing to, to happen. But um, 
the, the story, it's, it's all written up on, on the web, and, and you can read about it. Um, the, the students were, um, the, 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 the atheist stall, they, they were wearing this, this very innocuous, as Peter says, a very innocuous T-shirt. I don't know whether you know the Jesus and Mo cartoon, but it's incredibly gentle. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's, a, it's, it's mild and gentle and, and really benign. Um, and they were suddenly um, aware that a member of the student union executive who was a female Muslim wearing a headscarf um, came and started seizing their materials without saying anything, he just came and seized them and, and, and tore down their banners and, and, and um, asked them to remove their T-shirts, which had, which had Jesus and Mo uh, on. And they very reasonably refused and asked her why she was taking, that, taking their stuff down. Um, she was then joined by other members of the committee of the student union. They summoned a security officer who ordered them to take their t-shirts off. It went, went on and on. It got, got worse and worse and worse. And then they were threatened by... It, it, it extended beyond just the uh, student union officers to actual officials of the college itself. And a great big row has blown up about it. It's a clear violation of freedom of speech. And the, I think the reason Peter's asking about the, the influence of the left is that People on the left, in which I count myself, um, believe in free speech and uh, believe in all, all sorts of other good things like, like um, no, no oppression of women, um, that, that kind of thing, except where Islam is concerned. And suddenly, as soon as Islam is involved, all those nice liberal radical principles go out of the window. Um, so. Um, if, if the atheist um, people had been wearing really quite offensive Jesus T-shirts, nothing would have been done. It was, it's because of Muhammad. That's the reason. And I think what's going on in the mind of people on the, not everybody on the left, of course, but some people on, on the left, is that they're caught in this cleft stick that, on the one hand, they want to be liberal and in favor of, speech, of, of free speech and... Um, and no oppression of women and things. On the other hand, they're terrified of being thought racist. And there's a confusion in their minds that if, you're, if you say anything against Islam, you are a racist. It, it's a total nonsense to call Islam a race, obviously. I mean, the, most, the largest Islamic nation in the world is actually Indonesia. Very, very racially, totally different from, from Arabs, totally different from Pakistanis totally different from, from Somalis. There is no justification whatsoever for calling Islam a race, no justification whatsoever for calling any criticism of Islam racist. But they are confused in their tiny minds. They are they're muddled in the, and they're hip, hypocritical. It's almost the case that you can say something, actually I tweeted about this only today, um, that we are passionately against oppression of women unless that oppression is part of, quote, their culture. How patronizing and condescending can you get? And more and more people, I think, in, especially in Britain, maybe in this country as well, are waking up to the fact that there is a deep hypocrisy in the liberal left where Islam is concerned. They suddenly throw all their principles out of the window where Islam is concerned. It's as though fear of racism trumps all the other nice liberal principles. That, yeah, that, yeah. Um, I mean, that's so interesting to me. It just, you know, I don't know, it just does, simply does not seem that complicated to me. Look, if it's an immutable characteristic, like race is an immutable characteristic, just back off. But if it's an idea, all ideas are fear game. Islam is, is, is an idea. Islam is not a race. And so what we see is we see offices of diversity. We see speech codes. I don't, 
I, I personally don't see any evidence, at least in this country, I, I can't speak for other countries, my Muslim students are nothing but respectful, of course, that's engaging right. yeah. ideas, yeah. and it's unbelievably condescending yes. to think that because you're a Muslim you can't engage in a, 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 pr a conversation, and I don't, and again, I, I see that, not only do I see that coming from the left, but I am concerned, I am deeply concerned about, so I'm concerned about speech on on one side of it, but I'm also concerned about many Islamists use the use Islam as a political force, and what I see happening is when when we're asked to censor our speech, we're basically asked to give up a, a First Amendment right. We're we're asked to not criticize individuals who themselves are using a religion for a political purpose, and I'm deeply concerned about the shutting off of discourse on American universities. Yeah. It's very disturbing. I think it's a bit worse in Britain. And, and um, that, there was another example when Lawrence Krauss, the physicist, was invited to give a talk. We had, have a debate, I think it was, in, in London. Uh, one of the London college, I think it was University College London. And um, he heard in advance that the organizers were proposing to segregate the audience such that the women were not allowed to sit with the men. Um, now this is not, I mean this is, this is something that some sects of Islam um, demand. Lawrence said he would not speak if, under those conditions. Um, so they capitulated and said, okay, we won't enforce this segregated seating. Lawrence arrived at the, vet, at the venue and found that, they, that in fact the seating had been segregated. So he said he was going to walk out, and he did walk out, uh, and they were very upset and they rushed after him to try to persuade him to come back and um, they said well we'll we'll mix that mix them up and so I think three men token men went and sat in the women's section um, and um, Lawrence then then relented it was very nice of him to do so uh, I think I would have persisted in walking out and I think he possibly regrets coming back but he's a nice guy and he didn't want to cause a fuss, but that, so that's, well, that's what happened. Similar things have happened in other British universities, and it's perhaps not totally surprising that if, if something is organized by this particular radical sect of Islam, that that happens. What's truly worrying, though, is that the student um, unions, the student politicians right. um, in, in Britain are kowtowing to this and, and saying, well, it's part of their culture, we should respect it. This dreadful word respect, which is constantly being used to, to, to browbeat us into forsaking our principles. That's what's happening in they're some bullies. British universities. They're, univers they're yeah. bullies. There's no yes. other word. They, 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 uh, to borrow a phrase that I read from Kaziz, they bully ideas off the table. So, you know, another question I was thinking of, many of my colleagues, they won't even talk about it in class because they're afraid of a complaint and, and I would argue that the complaint would not come from a Muslim student. I would be astonished. I speak very freely. I've never had a complaint from a Muslim student. It's, no. Yeah, so I mean, what advice could you give my colleagues who are petrified of speaking about these issues for fear of offending people? I mean, it's, just, it's like a stranglehold. Why on. shouldn't you offend people? Right. I mean, of <laughs> yeah. I mean, on my recent, on my previous visit to this country, I was in Florida just a few months ago, and a teacher there told me a story. I try and remember it. I hope I don't get the details wrong. Um, she was a teacher of biology, and she was teaching evolution, as she should. It's a central theorem of biology. And one... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, why is that funny? This is the United States. Sorry? <laughs> um, uh, you, you, you cannot teach biology without evolution. It's, it's, it, it pervades the entire subject. So this teacher was doing that. One student complained to her parents that, her, that she, was, uh, she was offended by having evolution taught. Uh, in, 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 this, in her school class. The parents claimed, uh, the, the parents went and complained to the head teacher of the school, 
who summoned the biology teacher and dressed her down, scolded her for offending this child, ordered her not to teach evolution anymore, even though this was only one child in I don't know how many in the, in the class. That meant that all the other children were deprived of a proper education simply because one child of ignorant, bigoted parents had complained to the school and the head teacher, an obvious coward, had capitulated to this uh, really a appalling state of affairs. Fortunately, the biology teacher herself was uh, a teacher of initiative and she went to the nearest university and invited a professor to come and teach evolution since he was not employed by the school. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that, and that, I suspect that story may not be atypical. I don't know. Perhaps others here have similar stories. Yeah, we're, we're, having, we're having this problem not only with intelligent design, but it's a deeper problem. I think it's a, it's a deeper problem because it's coupled with this fear of offending people. Yes. And I, I don't know, I don't know what, I don't know how we, we reverse the tide of of this affecting, you know, not only K through 12, but our uh, institutions of higher education. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm afraid not only for the state of science, but the state of humanities. When I see, you know, when someone says I'm offended, that's it. That's the end of the discourse. I mean, that's just well, that's it. I mean, may, may I quote Stephen Fry when when somebody? <laughs> yeah. You're offended. So fucking what? <laughs> All right, I will. Uh, I'm gonna so I'll switch gears on you again. Um, early in an appetite for wonder, you mentioned LSD and that you thought about taking it. And s some British writers, and you note Huxley in your book. Uh, have recommended it. Do you think there's anything for people to learn by taking LSD or other psychotropic substances? <laughs> I was at I was uh, uh, two years in Berkeley, California, uh, <laughs> in 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 the in the late 1960s, um, and uh, nobody ever offered me any LSD. I wasn't even offered marijuana. Um, and so um, I only quite recently a, a friend, a colleague um, offered to mentor me on a <laughs> on an LSD trip um, she, she said that she would take a half dose uh, which would enable her to empathize with what I was going through but <laughs> she would still be she would still have her feet on the ground and wouldn't attempt to fly or anything like that um, and I was very tempted by this offer, and it's indeed still open. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote to my father's first cousin, uh, who is a distinguished um, psychopharmacologist, who was actually, it was he who actually introduced Aldous Huxley, whom you mentioned, oh. um, to, to, um, to uh, mescaline was the drug that, that Huxley took. Um, and I sort of rather expected my father's cousin to, um, to say, yes, go for it. But he didn't. Um, he said the, 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 the risk of a bad trip is, is, is great. Uh, and so he was on balance, he was against it. And I so far have taken his advice. But I am very tempted. I mean, I... What, what, do you, what, do you, I mean, what are you hoping to get out of that? What would you hope to get out of that experience? I've read Aldous Huxley's um, Doors of Doors Perception. Of Perception. Yeah, great book. Um, and um, my father's cousin has also written a book describing his own experience with mescaline. Um, his name is John Smithies. Um, I've read both of those, and it does appear that uh, these drugs give you a, a quite astonishing experience of, I don't know, insight, or maybe it's just, maybe it's all delusional, um, seeing things in a totally different way. Um, you might get some inkling of what it might have been like to be Van Gogh uh, painting those amazing paintings that he did. Um, 
I sort of vaguely thought is one thing that I ought to do before I die. Um, and maybe I will. <laughs> do, do you think it, some, people are, some people are clapping? Yeah, go for it. Uh, do, do, you, do you think it's a way for people to have a mystical experience without buying into any silliness? Well, yes. I mean, the, I, I thought that actually when um, I was taken by the BBC to Canada uh, to, to meet a scientist called Michael Persinger. Oh, well, yeah. The God helmet guy. Yes. So he puts, a, he puts a helmet on your head and passes magnetic fields through your head and you sit in total, total darkness and silence. And 80% of his subjects report um, mystical experiences of one sort or another. Um, if they happen to be brought up Roman Catholic, they tend to see Virgin Marys. Um, and it, it, it depends what your, what your religion is. I was curious to do this. I, I, I agreed to do it. And the BBC flew me over there in order to do it. They wanted to make a documentary about it, and they thought I'd make a good test subject. And um, I did not expect to see Virgin Marys or anything like that. Um, what I did expect was that would be that I've had some sort of um, feeling of oneness with the universe or, or, or something like that, some kind of mystical um, experience, perhaps in keeping with, with, uh, with science. Um, and I, I, that wouldn't have surprised me. I was hoping for that, actually. I was looking forward to it. It didn't happen. Uh, really nothing happened at all. And I suppose, I mean, Persinger said, well, I must be one of the 20% to whom it doesn't work. Okay, what, so you, went, you just, nothing? I mean, what, you, what I, mean I, I sat in a dark room for an hour, and, and, <laughs> um, and that's what happened. Uh, um, the, the BBC's idea of a, of a control um, was to have one other person uh, who was a vicar, a local vicar. Oh. Um, and so he went through the same experience the, immediately after me. And he also reported that nothing happened to him. However, um, Persinger was monitoring our EEG waves, our, our brain waves. And my EEG waves were exactly right for the 20% who don't, who don't get it, who don't have the mystical experience. The vicar's EEG waves were absolutely first-class mystical. Um, I mean, his, his EEG waves sort of went off the dial as far as, as, far as, the, as, far as Persinger was concerned. But he reported that nothing happened. And so Persinger, I think, thinks that he lied. Um, and um, uh, I think, no, what he, what he observed was that the EEG waves at first were textbook for the 80% for whom it, whom it works. But then they started filling up with random noise. And Persinger believes that the, what the vicar was doing was deliberately trying to shut it out by re rather than reciting multiplication tables to himself or something like that, um, trying to distract himself as though he was afraid that mystical experiences could have been in induced by scientific means. So it's not clear to me why he should be afraid of that. I suppose you could kind of make a garbled, incoherent case why a vicar might not want that to be, to, to be induced by, by a magnetism. Yeah, it, it would be interesting to me. I mean, it, it, if people went in there and had, if everybody went in there and said, Jesus Christ, mm. that would be some kind of evidence. Maybe, I don't know what it would be evidence for, maybe supernatural or something, but because, given no, that... No, it wouldn't. I mean, it, would be, it would be. Yeah, okay, it wouldn't. I was trying to be charitable, but <laughs> but say, so but if people went in there and they had a, a different mystical experiences of a faith tradition other than their own, yeah, that would be more impressive. Yeah, I mean that that would be, I, I don't know, what would that be evidence? You of? mean if a if a Muslim went in and said Jesus Christ? Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. If everybody who went in there said or Zeus? Yes. <laughs> Thor is the one I would fancy. Yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, on a lighter note, you're, you're, many people have uh, wanted me to ask this question. I'd be remiss if I did not ask this question. Your wife, Lala Ward, is known for her charitable work in Denville Hall and for her acting career and audiobooks. She played Time Lady Romana on Doctor Who. Are you a Doctor Who fan? Well, 
First of all, she also painted this tie. And can I just sort of... Um, um, I know it... I, I, I know it doesn't match the shirt, but that's to show it off all the more, all the more vividly. Um, she, she paints all, all my ties. They're, they're all completely unique, one-off ties, which is why I always take them off when I'm having a meal, because I'm terrified of spilling the soup on them. Um, Doctor Who fan, I had, had never actually watched Doctor Who when I met her. Um, I'd heard of Doctor Who when I met her. Um, and. After I met her, I did watch um, tapes of her episodes. She was the um, assistant to uh, Tom Baker, who many regard as the definitive Doctor Who, uh, and, her, and uh, Lala as the definitive companion. And I must say, I enjoyed those tapes very much. Um, I think partly because the scripts were written by Douglas Adams, yeah. and therefore were witty, satirical, um, and with something to amuse adults as well as children. I mean, it, Doctor Who originally at least was a children's program. Um, and, but with Douglas Adams' scripts, there's a sort of ironic level uh, which the children probably don't get, uh, but which adults can really appreciate. It's very, very, very funny, very, very cleverly written. And Lala tells me that uh, not only that, but that she and Tom Baker also ad libbed quite a lot and, and also added oh, um, really? witty touches which were not in the script. And they did that especially when Douglas wasn't the script writer. Oh. They, kind of, they kind of Douglas up the script. The, 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 uh. So, uh, are you a Doctor Who fan? <laughs> well, I, I appear to be a fan of that particular era of Doctor Who. Okay. I, I haven't watched any of the others, including the, the, the revival ones. Okay. Um, who, who's the one that people like? Um, Yes, okay. I, I did see David Tennant playing Hamlet, and, and he was good. <laughs> oh, and I did play a cameo um, in Doctor Who myself, but I was oh, only on for about, about half a minute. What, what, uh... I was, I was, I was, I was playing myself. I was in a, t I was wheeled in into a television studio, and I had to say, but look at the stars! <laughs> We're in a completely different part of the universe. <laughs> um, on a more serious uh, note, because I know that we have time. Where's the, the time? Oh, so, we, so we have, uh, okay. So on a, on a, on a more serious note, um, how has Hitchens passing affected you? He's a terrific loss. Uh, he, he, I think he is the most eloquent orator I've ever actually heard. I mean, he's got a superb, he had a superb uh, voice, uh, this wonderful deep baritone, rather like Richard Burton, I always thought. Um, and it's incredibly quick on his feet. Um, multitudes of facts at his disposal, perfectly delivered sentences, uh, a master of the put-down, um, the so-called hitch slap. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it's a very, it was a very, very sad day when, when he went. He was courageous to the last. Uh, I was one of the last people to interview him. I, I guest edited the the British um, ma magazine New Statesman for the Christmas issue, and they invited me to, to, to guest edit it. And one of the things I did was interview him in Texas. Uh, it was the day before I was to present him with the Richard Dawkins Award of the, um, the, the, the Atheist Alliance. Um, and so we had a, a long time together talking, and he was somewhat weak, but he was absolutely courageous and straight out and, and exactly as he always had been, slightly weak in the voice. And then next day at the, at the Atheist Conference, I, I had to make a speech in his honor. And then um, he may, came up on the stage. So may I ask what, did he, what he said to you? 
It's all written in the New Statesman. I can't remember. I mean, it was, it was a, a, a wide-ranging interview about all sorts of things. Um, and then at the, the next day at the conference, I had to... I mean, I introduced him. I, I made a speech in his honor. Um, he came up on the stage. Um, I hugged him. Felt very tearful about it. And then he held forth. Um, he, he was sitting down, I think he was too weak to stand, um, and he went on and gave that audience, uh, well, not their money's worth, because it, it that's not really relevant, but, but it was, a, it was a, a wonderful performance, a kind of swan song. They gave him a, a terrific standing ovation when he came. He, he, he was, wasn't well enough to come to the dinner, so he was up in the hotel room and then he was brought in at the end of the dinner and the whole dining room just stood up. And then he gave this tour de force of a speech, kind of valedictory, I think. Terrible loss. Yeah, it, it, affected, uh, it affected me and everyone with whom I've spoken who didn't even know him cried. Mm. I, I didn't know him that well. I mean, I wasn't one of his lifelong friends. I, I only met him um, at the time when our books, our, our God books came out, which was roughly the same time, in about 2006 or 2007. So I wasn't one of his earlier friends like Martin Amis or, or Ian McEwan or Salman Rushdie. It was a terrible, terrible loss. Yes. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you see your legacy and what would you like future biographers to say about you? I tried to understand and I tried to help other people to understand. Um, I tried to foster clarity, honesty. Um, when, you, when you communicate, you should honestly want people to understand. Too many people, when they communicate, are trying to show off, trying to um, appear to be learned and um, wantonly language up what they say, make it more obscure than it needs to be. I would like to be remembered as somebody who never, ever did that, uh, who always wanted to be understood, wanted to be clear. By the way, some people even find clarity threatening. Uh, if you say something straight and clear, straightforward, unambiguous. It sounds to some people as though they're being attacked. Um, so I think I would like to be known for that. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Dawkins.